Hi. Reducing waste is a big deal in Australia. That's why the recent web classes were called Waste Terminator. It's all about terminating ideally or significantly reducing waste. In this video, you're going to hear from Gwen who attended our web class and she agreed to be interviewed. Gwen specializes in reducing waste, especially waste organics. So whether you are from a school, early childhood center or home, you're going to get a lot of value out of this video. Hi, I am Jan from sustainablebutterflies.com.au. There are five pillars of sustainability and one of them is waste, hence the content. Now, if you enjoy this type of content, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe because what it does, it makes the video more available and more suggested to other viewers. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Before we go to the interview, I just want to share three main reasons why reducing waste organics, in my opinion, should be a priority. It's way more important than plastic bags and straws and disposable cups and all of that that gets all the attention. Anyway, number one, waste organics is the only waste type at the disposal level that contributes to climate change. As you, as you probably know, it emits methane gas emissions, which are 26 times more harmful, more heat trapping than carbon dioxide. Imagine if you have one glass of wine or 26 glasses of wine at the same time. If you smoke one cigarette or 26 cigarettes at the same time, one chocolate cake or 26 chocolate cakes at the same time, right? That's how much stronger methane is when compared to carbon dioxide. Number two, in Australia, in general, we generate a lot of organics waste and mainly food waste. And in schools and preschools, we generate a lot of food waste and in early childhood, a lot of nappy waste, most of which goes to landfill, emitting these terrible methane emissions, 26 times uh, more harmful than carbon dioxide. It's quite hard to reduce this type of waste, unlike recyclables, right? And we did a little exercise during the web class which showed us that an average early childhood center with nappies generates on average 10 tons of nappy waste per year, which is the equivalent of seven average cars by weight. And the third reason is there is actually a lot going on in Australia at all levels. For example, since 2018, we have the Federal Minister for Waste Reduction. That never happened before. Uh, there is a national target of halving food waste by 2030 and also increasing diversion rate from landfill to 80% by 2030. So there's a lot going on. And we shouldn't miss on this amazing opportunity, uh, help the environment, help enrich uh, Australian soils, which are very low in nutrients, and inspire others. And by the way, one of the attendees suggested during the web class that uh, she struggles with a lot of paper waste. And it's across the sector, early childhood sector, something I actually ignored for a long time. So what I've done, I created a paper eliminator bonus which is linked in the description, so grab it there. I'm here with Gwen, who is the Senior Waste and Environmental Consultant at Just Waste. If you want to check Just Waste, there is a link in the video description, so have a look. Now, Gwen helps schools reduce their food waste through FOGO bins, Food Organics, Garden Organics, and her company also does waste audits and runs a FOGO composting facility in Tasmania. And this facility accepts any nappies which is the only nappy brand that is 100% compostable. So Gwen, thanks for attending our web class last month, the Waste Terminator yes. web class. And also thanks for your time today. I'm really excited. We have eight questions for you. And I'm so grateful that you, you know, you're giving us this time. So my first question is, why should educators and families care about reducing waste organics in schools, early childhood services and home? Great first question. All right. It's because organic waste has been identified around the world as a key climate change lever. So what I mean by this is when organic waste goes into landfill, it decomposes anaerobically, which means without oxygen, and it releases a major greenhouse gas called methane. Now it releases carbon dioxide as well, but methane is the killer. Methane is over 20 times more effective at trapping heat than carbon dioxide. So it's having a massive impact on that blanket around our planet. But 
there's good news. It doesn't last very long up there. So by dramatically cutting emissions of methane, we will have a dramatic effect of releasing some of that heat and help keep our planets warming to a humanly manageable rate. So this is recognized, it was actually one of the biggest focus of the last climate um, council and nearly 90 countries have signed a pact to urgently reduce methane emissions by 2030. And that includes Australia and by removing organic waste from landfill, that's one of the major focuses because it's the biggest win we've got and it's the easiest one for us to do and it's going to have a great impact. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. That's a, that's a great uh, opener and uh, framing that whole problem in that context. Now, my next question, Gwen, is um, do you have any tips for educators and center managers uh, and school teachers wanting to start reducing food waste in their schools and services? Ah, yes, food waste, that's a good one. So part of my role is to examine the amount of food in our waste streams, and it kills me how much of it is wasted. Now there's avoidable and unavoidable food waste, um, and I'm not even gonna touch on the fact that there's all these nutrients that are being lost in landfills while farmers and food manufacturers have to add chemicals to fertilize and supplement the foods. Anyway, so to reduce food waste in schools and centers, there's two ways to do this. There's a quick way, and then there's a longer term solution. So the quick way, is to write a letter to your parents letting them know that you won't be putting leftover food into your rubbish bins anymore but you're going to send it back in lunch boxes now this is really simple but it's so key if parents mm -hmm. don't know what children don't eat well they'll keep sending the same things into oh, lunch right. boxes and it's a waste of money so take mm -hmm. an, an apple for example or any type of food or biscuits or sandwiches parents are trying to do the right thing so uh, they're sending healthy food in and i cannot tell you how many school waste audits I have done and seen apples with one or two bites out of them and I'm sure almost every teacher can out, out there can relate to that as well but if parents knew this um, they maybe in the, if they saw the apple coming back with just one or two in the lunch box well maybe they'd start putting in half an apple and cutting it up so sending a pet letter to parents to ask them to be mindful of what's coming back every day it'll save them money and mm -hmm. it stops a lot of that organic waste. It's going to dramatically, instantly change what a school's waste stream looks like. So mm -hmm. that's the first one. That's an easy win. The yeah. second one, the longer term change is to move lunchtime eating. So kids are dying to get out in the playground. Everybody knows this. They want to get to their favorite spot in the playground. They want to get their favorite ball or they want to see their friends from other classrooms, etc. And so many of them rush through their food or they don't eat it all properly. Um, so you can do a couple of things. You can have it earlier. And that actually helps kids who don't have proper breakfasts. They get, little, they get to eat earlier in the day and they, more gets eaten. And then there's the play than eat approach, which means the kids have a chance. They go out and they play and they work up an appetite and then they actually get to eat more of their lunches. Now, there's been lots of studies done on this already. And this movement towards moving lunch times has um, gained a lot of traction in the US and it's gaining traction over here in Australia. And um, yeah, it's really worth investigating. There's been better outcomes come from this. And the way, not and obviously, of course, this, the waste stream is reduced. The kids are better fed. There's no point us being really good about healthy food if they're not actually eating it. Yeah. So, um, awesome. yeah, go, ha, it's worth a Google. Have a look. Moving lunch times. Okay. Very good. Thanks very much, uh, Gwen. That is uh, informative. Now, the third question is, uh, how did you manage to get three schools on board with FOGO? Because you have had some uh, big wins. So how did you make this happen? Well, I was hired by a local council. So I work one day a week as their waste educator. Um, I obviously have a lot of FOGO experience as well. I've rolled it out before. Um, but this council was very um, proactive. Um, they realize, as I think we all do, that starting a good habit uh, for life, you start early. It's the number one way to set up good habits is you start with the children. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to create an environment at school where they mirrored what they did at home and get kids used to the separation of organic waste out of landfill waste. So this is going to have long term and also intergenerational benefits because the kids compared to the parents to actually do it as well. So um, we started off with um, offering curbside waste collections of FOGO 
for free. So that's a oh. very, very small cost for a council because the, the trucks are already going around the neighborhoods anyway, collecting FOGO um, from curbside households. So mm -hmm. to go past a school, uh, now we've had a couple of little, um, we've, I've worked with each school to make sure we have a, a, you know, a suitable curbside location. And uh, I've also worked with the collector. And when we have enough of them on board, we'll be able to move to a commercial collection as well. So it's mm -hmm. a gradual process. But um, it's been really, um, it's been well regarded by the council, by the homes, and the schools have come on board um, because it's a, not only is it the right thing to do, um, we provide information and environmental education um, to work on offer. So I go into, I presented a waste-wise school program to the principals, where the free FOGO service is bundled with optional classroom visits covering sort of waste and food waste or composting worms. And, and it just gives the teachers a little bit of a break. And I come in and I talk for 30 minutes and we explain what a circular economy is. I can also offer, offer schools, set up their own green teams. So, um, and that way the kids actually collect the FOGO. <laughs> they love it, okay. believe it or not. And it provides them with something practical that they mm -hmm. feel like they're doing something about the environment because there's pretty, there's very little chance that there's kids out there in primary up who haven't heard something about climate change by now. Yeah. So I started okay. with going into the schools and um, doing a little sort of questionnaire asking, hey, what do you do with your waste? You know, what do you do with your recycling? Do you have anything like, do you do anything special like the soft waste plastics? Do you have events which are eco-focused just to get a, a survey uh, of what their current waste practices are? Do you have a green team? Mm -hmm. um, do you have an active um, parent teacher association who likes to, um, you know, has this type of focus is in doing things, some of the fundraisers like the mobile muster with sort of mobile recycling yep. programs. Mm -hmm. So find first out, find out where they're at, at that same time, find out where the principal sits when it comes to um, waste and um, and what their thoughts are on um, putting FOGO in. If you do not have that top-down support, um, mm -hmm. it's going to be very much an uphill battle. So yeah. Um, try, yeah. And if that's, if, if you're not getting, um, because they obviously, they have a lot of um, priorities as well. So it's about mm -hmm. putting this front and center and it's about mm -hmm. um, presenting the, um, this FOGO service as um, from the school's perspective. So, and to frame it where the benefits outweigh the hassle of changing habits in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So um, for the principals, it's the higher outcomes achieved by incorporating environmental education in classrooms. And yeah. there's, again, there's lots of studies which show that doing EE in classrooms actually presents better outcomes for children's education yeah so there's um there's and there's there's journals the scientific studies you can go i can put some links into the um the video description and yeah. find that research no, absolutely no. can i ask you something on this fogo rollout did it involve because in the waste terminator web class um where this was done at the early in the early childhood center there were there were these caddies you know they were they were given to the cook and then in the in the yes. actual rooms as well did this involve some kind of rollout of small bins? Like, was there one in a yes. kitchen canteen or in a foyer or in a corridor? How did it work in the school? Absolutely. You have to provide the caddy as well. And this is a part of it. This is a behavior change mechanism. So the caddy, even though some schools may have their own, the caddy is exactly the same one that they use at in, in the households. So the fact that it mirrors the what's at home and the what's in the classroom, that was important. It's also the visual cue. When we change a habit, um, we because waste, waste disposal is very automatic. We don't think about it. We're not mm. thinking about what we're throwing yeah. away. You know, yeah. we think about going to the classroom or we think about preparing dinner or whatever it happens to be. We don't think. So we have to raise it up out of the unconscious and into the conscious yeah. level. Okay. And for that, you need the visual cue. And the visual cue is the caddy. We've also um, personalized our caddies. So we like to, we've got little stickers and we've got little names on it and we make, get the kids involved in putting the stickers on there. So as yeah. it, again, it's part of that ownership. And, of, and, and, and these caddies, uh, Gwen, they were provided along with the bins? They were also provided or, by the, yes. So they were the, provided by yes. the council? So yes. the or school had to pay for it? 
No, the school did not have to pay for it. Okay. Um, it is relatively cheap. You will find that any council that has rolled out Fogo has a collection of caddies as well. Okay. Um, it's very rare for a council not to roll out the caddies with the Fogo bins mm -hmm. because you just don't get the uptake otherwise. Awesome. So you, you yeah. yes, yeah, so the caddy and they so they'll have a lot of stock of them still left over where they should yeah. be able to do something and to help you and, out there. And one final point on this before we move on to nappies is. Did this FOGO rollout with the council, uh, the actual waste service, waste removal contractor, was it the council or was it uh, subcontracted to another company such as JJ Richards, Cleanway or Suez or someone like that? How did that work? Absolutely. So in our council, it is contracted out. Mm -hmm. um to a waste contractor and in this case it's veolia but any oh, yeah. of those other ones you mentioned they also do them as well it depends on mm -hmm. your councils very few councils actually run their own truck um waste collection trucks because then yeah. that's a different type of business that's not called a council so councils mm -hmm. normally do source that um through, through a contract um okay. but some may not uh, and there's mm -hmm. also um you know there's some actually do have like litter collections and so they do have smaller trucks but um, it's pretty rare to get one that does a FOGO, but it's obviously worth checking with each and every council. Okay, fantastic. Now the question uh, number four, and now we're going to zoom in on nappies. So the, the, that uh, landscape is slightly shifting, uh, you know, because obviously that's more early childhood uh, focus. However, you know, if there will be parents or the, you know, younger children, older children, so that's relevant now. Nappies are a big planet warming, methane releasing waste type in early childhood services or anywhere else, uh, because most of the disposable nappies are landfilled in Australia at least. Now, an early childhood service, this is little exercise we did during the weight, weight, uh, uh, web class, with 50 children in the nappies generates approximately 10 tons of nappy waste per year, right? Uh, which is the equivalent of seven uh, average uh, cars, the weight of it, right? So that's a per year, right? So for one center only. Now you have experience with Eni nappies, the only nappy brand that is 100% commercially compostable in Australia. Can you tell us what makes these nappies unique? For example, how are they different uh, to other so-called eco nappies? <laughs> well, they're the only ones that are actually compostable. That's like front mm -hmm. and center. Yeah. None of the others are. So yeah. it doesn't matter how much um, organic content they have in it, no matter how sustainably they're produced, um, they're not compostable. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I'm not saying that it's greenwashing, um, but greenwashing is very, very common. And there are companies who have made genuine efforts to reduce their environmental impact with the materials they use in the nappies, but absolutely mm -hmm. none of them are certified 100% compostable. Mm -hmm. Every other nappy needs to go into landfill regardless. Yeah. And there they are a big part of the organic waste problem. And so, in fact, and this is what kills me, nappies that claim to be eco because they're made from bamboo or have a higher percentage of natural materials or made from renewable resources, well, if they're going into landfill, that means it's the high organic component yeah. going into the <laughs> landfill. And the more it will decompose and the more it produces methane. Exactly. So yeah. no nappy going to landfill is doing our planet any good. Exactly. Yeah, this is this is such a crucial point. And I'm so glad that you touching on it because this is something so important to realize. And, you know, great that people are uh, communicating it in this way. Um, so awesome. Now, well, sorry. Oh, let me just say one of my jobs is also to look at uh, residential waste streams. Yeah. So depending on what type of council it is, we um, look at all their different bins and what the main component is. And um, if you have a fairly younger profile, you can find 50% by weight of the waste going into a landfill can be nappies. Yeah. So it ch changes a lot depending on the socioeconomic, the, the demographics. So yeah. we are young families, older families, but everybody does it for three years, roughly. And uh -huh. that is and one of the biggest challenges I have is getting people to think beyond their own bin. Yeah. If they think that and then they think that all the, oh, their street, look at all those bins that are out on that day. And then you combine that and you combine that and you combine yeah. that. And the, the actual impact is phenomenal. Now, also, yeah, I know it's it's insane. Hey, it's tons and tons of nappies. Now, moving on to uh, actually, this is related to nappies. So, these ini nappies are commercially compostable. Now, can you tell us what does commercially compostable mean? Uh, can't people just compost them in the backyard compost? 
No, they cannot. No, it is not advisable at all. Um, the difference between commercially compostable and home compostable, think about it as a stir fry versus a slow cooked casserole. So commercially compostable, it's like a stir fry, it all gets put in in big volumes, and it gets hot. And that's the key. You must have a certain temperature that a commercially compostable material hits and stays at for a period of time to kill all the bacteria and mm -hmm. pathogens that can come from yeah. food waste, come from fecal matter. It's mm -hmm. imperative and it's measured by the EPA. It is mm -hmm. essential. And they have to send off um, samples all the time to keep their licenses. Mm -hmm. um, home compost yeah. is like a slow cooked casserole. You put bits in and it doesn't, um, yeah, it doesn't, you, you can't do it at home. You cannot reach those temperatures for the length of time needed to actually yeah. kill all the pathogens unless you make a hot compost at home. And that needs to be minimum one meter by one meter by one meter. Mm -hmm. And you have to have all that material and do it at once. And yeah. you, I mean, it can be done, but, and I have seen home compost steaming in snow mm -hmm. when I used to do this in the US. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. um, but you cannot do it with nappies. It's not, just not feasible. You'll never have that amount because nappies will come in on a regular basis yeah. for, for a long period of time. Don't do yeah. them in the backyard. It's not safe. You have to put it into Fogo bins. Yeah, uh, th thank you. Thank you. Because we, we also dispelling some of these myths because sometimes this word such as compostable, it's usually associated, I believe, well, I can't speak for other people's mind, but I dare to uh, guess that, you know, compostable usually means, well, there's a, some heap or a little compost bin in the backyard. So, you know, that people might yeah. think compostable nappy that goes in the backyard. So thanks for actually dispelling, busting this myth. So now the sec the other question there is, there are currently seven councils in Australia that accept any compostable nappies in their FOGO bins. Uh, and uh, overall, there are more than 500 councils in Australia. So uh, now you you convinced one of these councils the, uh, to to accept any nappies in these FOGO bins, right? Now, do you expect to see more councils accepting any nappies since there are 121 councils with FOGO? I would love to see that, uh, but I also understand the council's perspective, and yeah. that is the the challenge is that people get very, very confused with the greenwashing and um, all the beautiful eco nappies that are out there, they still have mm. plastic tabs on them. Um, and that is really bad for commercial compost. It doesn't matter how hot mm. you get it to kill all the uh, bacteria, you cannot get rid of that plastic. Now, yeah. if a composter is trying to produce a, uh, a compost at the end, which they can do something with, i.e. they pass it on um, to farmers for agricultural use, they can't have those little plastic tabs in there because that's mm. getting plastic into our food systems. Yeah. So the confusion out there with people who think they're doing, just like you say, compostable or, you know, it's environmentally friendly or it's made from bamboo, it's mm -hmm. not compostable mm -hmm. in a FOGO unless it is mm -hmm. this one brand. And so, and, and I'll be all for more brands coming on and making truly compostable nappies. Yeah. Um, so if you did want to actually go and if you've got FOGO um, and they haven't advertised that they accept any nappies, um, it is worth as a childhood center going and speaking to the council and seeing if you can have a an exemption to their nappy ban or seeing if you can have a do a contract with them like mm -hmm. I we guarantee to do the training with our staff we guarantee to make sure that we only have compostable nappies we show them that you're, you're with any um, mm -hmm. and then they it's totally acceptable in a commercial composting yeah. facility Eni's work um, the, but you need to go to them as a one-off because they won't ever advertise broad scale that mm -hmm. they accept compostable nappies because there's not enough clarification out there in the general Yeah, public. this is such an important point. And thank you for actually uh, clarifying this because I did uh, some waste audits with the scientists within, there are only three councils in Sydney that have FOGO beans and that is Randwick, uh, Woolara and Penrith. But none of these three councils that accept uh, that take FOGO beans actually accept compostable nappies. And I often heard from scientists, hey, we want to do compostable nappies and we have FOGO beans, but the FOGO, but the, they don't accept nappies in it. So now, uh, finally, I actually, truly, honestly, I didn't know how to bridge that gap. 
because if they don't accept it and there is no alternative, then what can you do? So, but now you actually giving them, you providing the light at the end of this uh, terrible nappy tunnel, <laughs> methane tunnel. So this is awesome. So thanks for that. Now, oh, my next question, we have two more questions. So do you have any tips for educators, center managers and families and teachers wanting to start using EME nappies in their centers uh, and homes? Um, well, I would say, um, obviously, first of all, you need to have FOGO mm -hmm. um, and you find um, a counsellor. Um, it's actually becoming, uh, find, a, find a counsellor who's interested in environmental issues. You know, they will always be someone on your council that has, uh, you know, a strong interest in this. They're representing mm -hmm. the community for a start. Yeah. Um, if you haven't got FOGO, you're also finding that it is becoming uh, legislation in a number of uh, different municipalities. Um, yeah. The EPA are tying a lot of grants to you must have FOGO. A lot of um, local government authorities are looking at FOGO and they will be rolling it on. You will see it in a lot more councils in Sydney in the next few years. Yeah, It's certainly gonna help if um, the community pushes for it. So yeah. that's your number one priority is to get FOGO. And the second thing is to, once you have your FOGO, once you've got your contract um, with the council that um, allows you to put your, your nappies into the FOGO bin, make sure you take other people on your journey. Make, mm -hmm. make sure people understand um, that this is what you're doing because there will be people who just, um, th their priorities aren't the same as your priorities. So if you explain mm -hmm. why you're doing it, um, you help people understand. Um, and then, you know, it's, it's going to be a bit of teething and it will again take training um, and education and support um, and recognition of the good job that you're doing. People, if they're changing habits, it's, it's important that you recognize what you've done um you know reward and congratulate yourself announce to the world that you're now going to eni make give yourself a target put it on a wall you know six months mm -hmm. we've been yeah. reduced our organic waste you know 12 months or, or whatever so make sure people um have something good to feel about it mm -hmm. yeah well that's great now and uh actually before we go to the final question i want to ask i just want to touch on this point when you mentioned that you you expect more uh, more fogo to be rolled out across Australia, uh, with hopefully with these compostable nappies uh, at the greater proportion that currently, which is about ten percent of the fogo uh, areas. Now, mm -hmm. do you think that it's because the we have this national target of reducing halving food organics, but also reducing methane emissions? Uh, do you think, or is that something it's other? No, it's totally tied together. Um, okay. Fogo, it, because it's organic waste and because it's households, it's a massive part of the waste stream. So mm -hmm. um, like a regular household waste bin is between 40 and 60% organic waste, mm -hmm. all of which could go yeah. into a Fogo bin and all of which is being currently sent to landfill, landfill and yeah. producing that carbon dioxide yeah. and that that methane. crucially important methane yeah. yeah so it is being it's a high focus for the australian government it's a high focus for state governments mm -hmm. it's a high focus for local governments it's happening all over the place it can't yeah. happen overnight to mm -hmm. um to, that's a big change it's the biggest thing to happen to the municipal waste stream since recycling came out so okay. yeah it's, right. and so there's cost implications there's um you know you've got to buy the the wheelie bins you've got to buy the caddies you've got to start an education mm -hmm. campaign you've got to get a contractor to collect it you've got to find somebody to take it so it mm -hmm. is it's a, it's a huge project uh, the last yeah. time i rolled it out in the council it was an 18 month project so wow um, okay yeah and of course there's so there's a lot of priorities in council um so show your yeah. support for getting organic waste out of the landfill by talking to your councillors mm -hmm. now okay fantastic and now the final question gwen is this um uh finally from your perspective what is the big waste related opportunity or roadblock uh, in australia uh, so what, what needs uh, addressing and uh, you can if you know if you want to zoom in on something very particular or if you want to talk at the big picture level and we don't have to talk uh, organics only we can of course but at a broad uh, level waste What's the biggest opportunity or biggest roadblock or challenge in Australia that needs addressing, do you think? Uh, the biggest opportunity is mm -hmm. householders. Uh, oh. The biggest change we need is knowledge. 
We need oh, to be able okay. to get people to think beyond their own waste bin and oh. look at the bigger picture. Look at this cumulative waste issue that we have. Um, and it's not, think about it as waste. It's actually material. We in the waste industry, we call it material mm -hmm. and it needs to circulate back into use. Yeah. But there's always going to be a fraction that we can't do anything with. It's contaminated or broken or it's mm -hmm. a composite product. So really the biggest thing that needs to happen is we need to avoid creating waste in the first place. We oh, need to right. rethink everything yeah. we consume, reduce mm -hmm. our waste, reuse our things, yeah. repair, and then recycle. Yeah, um, thanks so for it's that. The, it is a, a thriftiness and resourcefulness used to be a, a characteristics which were very admired a couple of generations ago. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we've just lost that. You know, this mm -hmm. land of plenty um, is uh, producing a phenomenal amount of waste. We're one mm -hmm. of the most wasteful countries on this planet per capita. Yeah, that's um, right. And there, so there is, it's that whole, um, the whole thought process of it's not waste um, and avoid, you know, over consuming. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and please, organic waste. We've got yeah. a small-ish window to get that organic waste out of landfill and it's going to have a massive impact. It should be mm -hmm. a no-brainer.